So we're into the fourth session in this series, looking at the Bible in widescreen. And just by way of reminder, the five parts of this series, we started out in the beginning of the story, and that's always a good place to start. Uh, This week we'll come towards the end of the story, but in the very first week we were laying the foundations looking at Genesis 1 and 2 and the whole idea of the big story of the Bible. Then in the second week we thought about how things went wrong with the fall and all of the chapters right through to Genesis 10 and into chapter 11, but how there was a new beginning with the call of Abraham. And then last session, we were thinking about the story of Israel and then how the Lord Jesus is Israel's Messiah. So this week, we're thinking about the church and the ending. And so our our seven-part story of salvation history goes like this, that there is creation and then the fall, sin enters into the world. Adam and Eve rejected God's word, rebelled against him. And then we see the consequences of that playing out in the world with how bad things got and how God brings judgment, but also blessing and grace. But then with the call of Abram, we have the beginning of the story of Israel, which is most of the rest of the Old Testament that leads us up, of course, to the birth of Jesus, to the Lord Jesus himself, who we read about in the Gospels, and then the death and resurrection of Jesus uh, and his ascension to heaven. And then with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, we have the beginning of the church. And uh, that is where we are now. That's where we live. But we're waiting for the return of Jesus. And when he returns, he will restore all things. And then there will be the final judgment and the new creation. So we are thinking about, well, we'll start off thinking again about Jesus in the middle of the story. The turning point right at the center is the person of Jesus. He's the central figure in the whole of history and in the whole of the Bible. But we will think tonight then about the church and about universal restoration. And I'm going to save the new creation for next time for the fifth session, just so that we have a really high note to go out on. But in that fifth session, we'll also be thinking about how this story fits together and how it allows us, when we read one part of the Bible, to appreciate where it fits into the whole and also how the, this story is our story and how it's different from the stories that people believe in the world, but how we can then have hope because of this true story of God in salvation history. So just to remind you, in the third session, we looked at the story of Israel, and we saw these three big characters, Abraham, who was the beginning of that story, uh, who received promises from God, and then Moses, who received the law from God, Uh, and gave that to Israel, and then David, who was God's anointed king. And in these three things, we see the old covenant, as we called it, that God made with the nation of Israel. Uh, He gave them promises that they would have a, a people, a land, and a blessing. And with Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, we see the the promise of the people beginning to come true as he has many sons and they become the tribes of Israel. With Joshua, the successor of of Moses, we see them entering into the land that God had promised. And then through Solomon, with the building of the temple, we see the blessing of God on Israel in, in his wisdom and his wealth and how that blessing is shining out to the nation so much so that people like the Queen of Sheba come to see his his splendor um, in in Jerusalem. Uh, And that's really the high point, if you like, of Israel's story. But Solomon, as with all of these other characters, was, was not the perfect sinless king. In fact, he goes after other gods. Uh, And so God divides the kingdom and uh, then ultimately takes them into exile. And so Israel, which was called from among the nations to make God known to all nations, didn't do that. But with the birth of Jesus, 
we move into a new stage and we saw that Jesus did what Israel did not do in his baptism and his temptation and even in his birth we see the story of Israel played out again and how he he is tested in the desert tempted by Satan but is without sin Israel was tested in the desert and and grumbled and sinned and so didn't enter into the land that generation Uh, and the story of Israel of course is this story of going off after other gods and failing to keep the law of God but Jesus is faithful he never sins he never breaks the law he never is disobedient to his father and so Jesus does what Israel cannot do he the sinless son of God lives the perfect human life. In a sense, that this great people of God, which is this big nation of, of Israel, has narrowed right down to one person. In fact, Jesus is a, a second Adam. He's a new beginning, not just for Israel, but for the whole human race. He does what Adam didn't do. He is obedient to God. Of course, Jesus taught and performed miracles. Well, what did he teach about? Well, the main theme of Jesus' teaching, the biggest thing that he talked about was the kingdom of God. And since we know the Old Testament story of Israel, that shouldn't be a surprise because there was a kingdom and, of course, the promise of a king in David's line. And Jesus, the descendant of David, is the king. God's Messiah, the anointed one. But when Jesus taught about the kingdom, he explained that God's kingdom had arrived with his coming. The king had come. So the kingdom was here. The kingdom, as Jesus talks about it, is not so much a bit of land as it had been for Israel in the Old Testament, but it is the rule of God. Here is Jesus who is obedient to his father, who is establishing God's kingdom. And Jesus said that that this kingdom derives not from the earth. It's not because he led an army that rebelled against Rome who were oppressing Israel at that time and set up a kingdom or, or was voted in by people, but his authority came from heaven, heaven breaking into our world. And he taught his disciples to be kingdom people. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, Jesus describes what life under God's rule is like. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on to explain exactly what that looks like. How do kingdom people live? But Jesus also made it very clear that nobody is automatically in this kingdom. It's not that all of the Israelites, all of the Jews who were descended from Abraham by birth are in this kingdom. No, if you want to enter this kingdom, you have to have a new birth, Jesus said, to be born from above, to be born of the Spirit. And he also explained that to enter the kingdom, you have to turn away from sin, and become like a little child, he said. Humble yourself. Come to God recognizing that he is the king. And Jesus also taught that the kingdom is here now. In his parables, he said the kingdom is growing like seed, and and, and often it's unseen. It's growing in the world, but the fullness of the kingdom is future. It's only at the end that we will see the fullness of God's kingdom. So we, who are disciples of Jesus, are already kingdom people in the kingdom through faith in Jesus, living by the qualities, the standards of the kingdom, but it's only in the future that we will see its fullness. Jesus also taught that with his coming, there was going to be a new way of worship. So Jesus, like all of the Jews at his time, he he was following the Old Testament law. The temple was there. The sacrifices were being made. The festivals were there. But Jesus said that 
With his coming, it was like new wine that wouldn't be held in old wineskins, okay? So if you take old wineskins, not that I've ever tried this, I don't even know if wineskins are still available in this country, but if you get an old wineskin, over time they get inflexible and new wine don't put it in because the wine skin will burst as that new wine, I guess, in those days continued to ferment and expand and the wine skin will burst. And Jesus says, new wine needs a new wine skin. He was saying that this Old Testament way of worshiping God through the temple and the priesthood, it was good and it was right for its time, but now there would be a new way. And when he spoke to one woman Beside a well in Samaria in John chapter 4, he said to her, you know, the Jews worship God in Jerusalem. That's where you should worship him. You Samaritans, he said, worship at this mountain. That's wrong. But the time is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Not in one special place, not in one special building, not uh, just through uh, the law that God has given, but by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a little bit of the teaching of Jesus. But of course, the gospel story uh, and the gospels in our Bibles build up and focus on the reason that Jesus came to die for our sins and to rise again from the dead. And just before that, Jesus spoke about a new covenant. So we mentioned the old covenant that God made with Abraham and so on. But Jesus, shortly before his death, when he had a Passover meal, remember that? So he takes the Passover meal with his disciples, remembering how God saved Israel in the time of Moses. And after that meal, he did something new. He takes bread and he takes a cup of wine and he says, this bread is my body, which is given for you. He's going to die for them. His body will be hung on a cross, put to death. This, uh, do this in remembrance of me. Of course, that's familiar if you've been involved in church. That's something the church does. It's a core activity of the church, taking bread in remembrance of Jesus. And likewise, he took the cup and he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The old covenant was sealed in the time of Moses by blood that was sprinkled on the people, the blood of a lamb. And Jesus says, this new covenant is going to be sealed by my blood shed for you. Well, what is that new covenant? Well, the prophet Jeremiah spoke about it. And here's what God said through Jeremiah, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. I've put in red three sets of words, the three I wills in that covenant. Just like the old covenant had three promises, this covenant too has three promises. And starting in the middle, it says, I will be their God and they will all know me. Well, how did Jesus teach people to pray to God as Father? There is a new kind of relationship with God, the Father, through Jesus. An intimate relationship where you know him. And it's not that you need some people who are teachers or some people who are priests, like in the Old Testament, who can mediate between you and God. No, you, all of you, from the least to the greatest of you, can know God and know his love for you. That's the new covenant. And the Son, because God promised, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. How could that be? You see, in the old covenant, they had to keep on making sacrifices, didn't they? 
You couldn't just make one sacrifice and say, there you go, that's it, done with, and no more. No, you had to keep on bringing sacrifices because you kept on sinning. And because really, the sacrifice of an animal could not pay for your sin. But here is Jesus, whose blood seals the new covenant, who makes one sacrifice for sin forever. So that those who trust in him don't have to bring any more sacrifices. Because we remember that Jesus made the sacrifice. Sins forgiven. Sins never remembered again. The record struck clear. Well, if the Father and the Son are there, you can see where it's going, can't you? Because God said, I will write my laws on their hearts. Where was the law written in the Old Covenant? Well, it was quite wonderful. God, with his finger, wrote it on stone. But where is the law written now in the New Covenant? In the hearts of those who are New Covenant people. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul explains it that way. If you want to read it in 2 Corinthians 3. That as we look at Jesus, the Spirit changes us. He writes God's law on our hearts. So the law, which is still God's standard of holiness, is no longer something that we just look at on stone tablets and try our best to keep it. The law, the standard of the law, is something that the Spirit of God enables us to keep. He gives us the power to overcome sin. He gives us, he leads us to do God's will. The new covenant carries on from the old covenant, but it is not like it. It is much greater. And it's much greater because of what the Son has done for us in his sacrifice. Because he has introduced us to the Father and because the Spirit is at work in our lives. A covenant We've seen this in previous sessions, has parties, promises, a response, and a sign. Though the parties to this covenant are God and Jesus, and everyone who is, to use a wonderful phrase in the New Testament, in Christ. You see, it's with Jesus that God makes this covenant, the perfect, sinless Son of God. But if your faith is in Jesus, then you get to benefit from this covenant too. You get to share in his inheritance. And the promise is that you can know the Father through the Son by the Spirit. That's the pattern of Christian faith. That's why we pray first and foremost to the Father. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. In the name of the Son, as the Spirit leads us. And our response Well, it's not really different from the old covenant in that sense. It is faith, believing God's promise, trusting God to do it, and obeying him. But we do it in the power of the Spirit. And what are the signs? Well, baptism has something to do with it. It's a symbol in acting. The people who trust in Jesus are baptized to symbolize his death. And his resurrection is now our death and resurrection. The old me is gone, the new beginning in Christ. But every time we take communion or the Lord's Supper, whatever we call it, we are remembering this covenant. That we know the Father through the Son, by the Spirit. Now, the last thing to say about Jesus is that he he called people to follow him. And from amongst the people who followed him, from amongst his disciples, he appointed some to be apostles. That's important because the apostles are the continuity from Jesus to the church. They become the nucleus and the foundation of the church because Jesus talked about the church. He said that he would build his church. He took his disciples to a place called Caesarea. And there he said to them, who do people say I am? And they said, oh, people of all sorts of theories about who you are. One of those prophets from the Old Testament, maybe John the Baptist. And Jesus said, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God. You are God's son. 
It's an amazing declaration of faith in Jesus. It's the beginning of something new. It has dawned on Peter, and it's beginning to dawn on the disciples as a whole exactly who Jesus is. And Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I will build my church. The word that Jesus used is probably a word that comes from the Old Testament. Certainly in the Old Testament translated into Greek, it's used the same word, which was used of the gathering of Israel, God's people. And so what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to build a new people of God. It's not going to be the nation of Israel anymore. It's a new people of God, my church. And the church is formed by Jesus, but it is founded on the apostles. You are Peter. Jesus gave him that name. Simon, a very common name. Jesus gives him a very strange name, Peter, which means a stone or a rock. Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, he's not saying, as some people think, that Peter alone is the the foundation of the church. We'll explain that in a moment. But he is saying that with every person who, like Peter, trusts in Jesus and confesses him, they get built into the church. But that begins with the apostles. And so he says to Peter and the other apostles, you will have authority to bind and to loose. That's a way of talking about teaching. The rabbis who taught would say they bound this and loosed this. Jesus is saying you will be the ones who will teach and lay the foundation for the church. Later on in Matthew's gospel, he talked about the church again and he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am with them. Jesus' authority, my name and Jesus presence that's what the church is about people who confess that Jesus is Lord and who who recognize his authority and who come together to enjoy and celebrate his presence church is people it's not a building we sometimes call it that but it's really the people and Jesus appointed his apostle And apostles are authorized representatives of Jesus. Like an ambassador. An ambassador has the authority to speak for the country they represent. And the apostles that Jesus appointed had authority to teach. Jesus said to them shortly before his death. He said, I have much more to say to you than you can now bear. But when the spirit of truth comes, the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He didn't say that to us, to all Christians. He said that to the apostles, that they would remember the things he taught and the Spirit would reveal additional truths to them. And right at the end, after he dies and he rises again and he meets them on a mountain, he gives them his commission and he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Do you see it again? Jesus' authority. And at the end, he says, surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Do you see Jesus' presence? This is the church. Where two or three gather in my name under my authority, I am there. I will be with you. And what are they to do? They're to go and make disciples from all nations. To fulfill what Israel did not do. To shine God's light. To take the truth about Jesus. The teaching of Jesus to the world. And what are they? how do they make disciples? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And the things the Spirit would continue to teach them. For us, that's the things that are recorded 
Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, the Apostles' teaching in the rest of the New Testament, these are the things we are to believe, to obey, and to pass on. So we're into the fifth act, the church. The Apostles, who Jesus appointed, are the beginning of the church. And so the Acts of the Apostles is the book that tells us how the church was established and grew as the Spirit of God came, as Jesus said it would. The apostles who wrote down for us uh, and whose actions we have in Acts and who wrote the New Testament that we have. And towards the end of the New Testament, it says that there is a faith that has once for all been entrusted to the saints. In other words, our job is not to find out new truths about God, but to stick to the truth that has been revealed through Jesus and his apostles. But what is the church? The new covenant people of God who know the Father through the Son by the Spirit. There's different pictures that describe that in the New Testament. The church is the people of God. You might remember when we thought about Israel and we thought about them coming out of Egypt, we saw that the pattern for Israel was that God redeemed them and then they responded in obedience and then they were to represent God to the world. Well, it's exactly like that for the church. Those who trust in Jesus, who are redeemed by him, our response to that should be to obey God and to go into the world as his representatives. And so the apostle Peter, that one to whom Jesus said, you are Peter, you're the stone, you're the rock, and on this church, on this rock I will build my church. That same Peter wrote these words. He said, as you come to him, not apostles this time, but you, me, all of us, As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You offer them to the Father through Jesus by the Spirit, okay? But do you see that? You are a living stone because you are expressing faith in Jesus just like Peter did. And you get built in to this same spiritual building. And Peter carries on and he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Does that ring a bell? That's exactly what God said of Israel. You will be my royal priesthood. But now it's not Israel, the nation. It is this church, this new people of God in Christ from all nations. You are God's special possession. So that you will declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy. Now you have received mercy. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it wonderful how your identity, whatever background you came from, from a world that's divided, chopped up into all of that people and this people and that community and this community, but when you come to Christ, you become something new, a living stone built into the church. The church is God's building. And you get this not just from Peter, but from the Apostle Paul writing in Ephesians. He says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. You are fellow citizens with God's people. And also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You see it? The foundation is their teaching. The apostles and the prophets, the whole of the scriptures. That's our foundation. With Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. That picture is a a Roman building. And you might notice there's one very large stone. That's the cornerstone. And that's the first stone that gets laid. And it's the stone that must be perfect. It has to have an exact right angle because all of the other stones will be lined up with it. And if it's not straight, you're going to get wonky walls. Okay. If you want straight walls, you get the master mason to make 
an absolute right angle. It wasn't easy to do back then. That's what Jesus is. And Jesus is the stone that is perfect in obedience to the Father. How do we get built in? Because we get lined up with him. And when you bring your life in line with him, you are built into this building. And in him, in Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him too, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You see that? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit again. You are God's people. Lined up with Jesus, the cornerstone. Founded on his apostles. And indwelt by the Spirit of God. That's one picture. Another picture, of course, is the body. Because the church is a living thing. And living stones are quite hard to imagine, aren't they? But we all have a body that we live in. And so Paul explains, it's like, well, you know the way your body has different parts and all those parts have their own function. That's what Christ has done. We who are many are built into one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, different functions, different things to do according to God's grace. And this body, he says in Ephesians again, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That's Christ. That's the head of the body. I need to grow up. You need to grow up to be like Jesus. And sometimes we kind of think of that meaning I individually need to, which is true. But actually, how does that happen? It happens through you. Because I don't have all the functions that are needed for this body to be healthy. I need to learn from you. You can serve me and I can serve you. We are the body of Christ. And from Christ, the whole body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. It's a beautiful picture of what God has done. The Spirit empowers us to serve each other with the gifts that he gives and so when we come together as the church and when we take bread and we take the cup, we remember God's covenant. We remember that we know the Father through the Son, by the Spirit, until he comes. Because it's not going to go on like this forever. The Lord Jesus himself spoke of the day when he, the Son of Man, would come back again. This time, not as a baby like the first time but on the clouds with power and great glory. And he would send his angels and they will gather his chosen people, his elect, from the four winds, from all the corners of the earth. Again, when he was with his disciples just before his death, he said, my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Jesus left. He ascended into heaven, but he is coming back again. And the return of Christ will begin the restoration of all things. Now, need to explain why I call this universal restoration, because that idea is there in Scripture. Jesus talked about the renewal of all things. Now notice, I put the Greek word there, bear with me, but notice it says palingenesia. Do you notice that genesia means, that sounds like Genesis, doesn't it? It's a new Genesis, a new beginning, a new birth, literally, a new Genesis, back to the beginning. Or in Acts, it talks about the time when, when God will restore everything as he promised. Or in Colossians, it says that through Christ, it's not just that you and I who trust in Jesus get reconciled to God, but all things will be reconciled to him through Jesus. Again, 
the scriptures from Isaiah and then into Philippians and Romans say that the day will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus comes again, there will be no confusion about who the King is. Everyone will see it. Everyone will see his glory, his power, his majesty. Everyone will have to acknowledge this is the Lord. Everything that has gone wrong will be put right. But sadly, universal restoration does not mean universal salvation. It's not that everyone will be saved. The Bible is very clear about this. In those last few chapters of the Bible, in in Revelation, it tells us what will happen. There will be victory. Babylon will fall. What does that mean? Well, Babel, remember that? In the universal decay, the Tower of Babel, which then gave its name to the city of Babylon. And in Revelation, it talks about Babylon. It's the whole system of human society and economics and government without God. And the whole thing will collapse, never to rise again. The whole thing will fall. And then there's a wedding feast of the Lamb. There's a thought. That's what history is heading towards. A big wedding of the Lamb, Jesus, with his people. And then the word, which is Jesus, the word of God, he who is the word of God will conquer over all of God's enemies. And then when you get towards chapter 20, you have judgment, Satan and the beast are defeated. And then there is a second resurrection and the final judgment, which I'll explain in a middle, but in a minute. But in between, well, there's a description of a a kingdom for a thousand years. So there's a second resurrection at the, in Revelation 20. There's a first resurrection at the beginning of that chapter. And that raises a question. You notice the question, Mark. What about this millennium? Well, Christians have different ideas about this. Some say that this is the, the idea of premillennialism, that Jesus will come again, and then there will be 1,000 years on this earth before the final judgment. Some say, oh, The millennium is actually before Jesus comes again. So the world will get better and more people will become Christians. And then Jesus will come again. And some people say amillennialism. There is no literal 1,000 years. It's actually a picture of the whole history of the church. Now, I'm not going to come down concretely on one of these. I will say that I tend towards the first of those. I think the way it's described in Revelation, especially with this first resurrection and a second resurrection, doesn't really, I think, make sense unless there is an actual period of Christ reigning on earth. But I'm not going to fall out with other Christians who see that differently. I just want to acknowledge that there are those different ways. But what is absolutely clear as you get to the last part of Revelation 20 is that there is this final judgment. And just before that final judgment, the devil who deceived the world gets thrown into the lake of fire. Remember right at the the beginning, what went wrong? Well, the serpent who was the devil comes along and tempts no more leading astray, no more temptation, no question about who wins. The devil is defeated. And then it says this, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Do you notice that? It's a universal judgment. It's not just some people. There's nowhere to hide earth and heaven. Everything that could possibly hide you away from this throne is gone. It's, it flees away and you stand as one of these many people before the throne of God's judgment. Scripture is really clear about that. God will judge. And it says, uh, the books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. Please notice that. There are books and there is a book. 
Okay? And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Not only is Satan gone, death is gone. And Hades, the place of the dead, is gone. There's nowhere for anybody to be dead in that way anymore. Everybody has been raised. Everybody stands at the judgment. And everyone... Well, what they've done is written in the book. How does that make you feel? What's that going to mean for me? Well, if it's all about what's written in the book of what I have done, then I'm going to have nowhere to hide. And no one on this earth will have anywhere to hide when the evidence of how we have lived is there in God's book. God sees it all. God knows every injustice that has been done in the world. God knows every wrong thing that has been done to you and he will hold people to account for that. And he knows every wrong thing that you have done, which is when it gets really scary because you realize, I'm guilty. If those books are a record of my sins, there's going to be a lot there. Not one person who could stand in that judgment on the basis of what they had done. Don't think for a minute it's kind of, well... You know, maybe the good stuff will outweigh the bad. No, look at what it continues to say. It says, this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he or she was thrown into the lake of fire. The default when the books are read is, that's where we're going. Into the eternal second death from which there is no return. But anyone whose name was not written in this book goes there. So who doesn't go there? Not the people whose good stuff outweighed the bad. That's not not how it works. Only those people whose name is also written in this book, the book of life. And how do you get your name written in there? Through faith in the Lord Jesus. Through faith in God. Abraham's name is written there, even though he lived long before Jesus, because he trusted what he did know of God and obeyed God. And your name can be written there if your faith is in the Lord Jesus. And you or I will not have any hope of escaping hell, the lake of fire, because of what we do. If it's all about what we do, that's where we're going to end up. No, we will escape only if our name is written by God in the book of life, Because we have confessed our sin to him, owned up, turned away from it, trusted in Jesus as my savior, and committed my life to him. There is a final judgment, but there is hope for those who believe in the Lord Jesus. This is how the Apostle Paul described it, writing to Christians in a place called Thessalonica. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. I love that picture. As Christians, really, when we talk about other Christians who have died, we shouldn't really say they're dead. I mean, they are, but their body is. But they're they're really asleep because their soul is not dead. They're asleep in Christ. It's a lovely picture. They're just waiting to be woken up again. And the day is coming when they will. So that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive when Jesus comes again who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so... We will be with the Lord forever. Encourage each other with these words. That's a lot of encouragement, isn't it? 
That's the hope. I'll talk next week about the new creation, but if there's one thing you need to know about, if you've ever asked the question, what's heaven going to be like? It should be enough to know that you will be with Jesus. That's what Jesus said. I will take you. I'll come back and I'll take you to be with myself. That's what he wants, to have you with him. That's where our hope is for those we love who have died in Christ. That's where your hope is. And so as we come to the end of this session, I just want to say this. I've kind of skimmed over a lot of the book of Revelation. You'll notice that. That would be a whole series in itself. There's a lot of images in there, but I want you to notice this. There is a backbone to the book of Revelation, and it is this, that heaven is praising God for creation in chapter 4. Praises God because he has created everything. And he is so wise as creator. And then in chapters 5 and 7, heaven is praising God now because he has redeemed for himself a people, the lamb that was slain. And then when you get to chapter 11, heaven is now praising God because he's going to restore everything by the lamb's reign, the king is coming, and by judgment. Do you notice that? That's the big story of the Bible, isn't it? Creation, and then redemption through Jesus, and the restoration of everything. And the thing about, about this in, in the book of Revelation is that this praise that is going on all the time in heaven comes down to earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Of course, that's going to happen in the final day, isn't it? Everything put right. The earth will praise God just as heaven does now, but you don't have to wait until then for you to join in. You get to join in now with the praises of heaven to say, this is the God who created this lovely world and me. This is the God who has redeemed me from my sin. And this is the God who will put everything that is wrong with this world, which isn't always so lovely, right again in the end through his good reign. And so the challenge for you and me is this, that Jesus right at the very end of Revelation says, I am coming soon. And John who wrote it says, amen, come Lord Jesus. Have you ever found yourself saying that? I found myself saying it earlier after I listened to someone's story that was heavy of things that are not the way they ought to be. Lord, would you come? But if we're going to say that, then we need to realize the message of Revelation is really clear. The Lamb, Jesus, wins. And we must overcome the world when, right at the beginning, the letters to the churches that Jesus writes time and time again, to who the one who overcomes, I will give this blessing. So how do you overcome? Well, in John's letter, he says this. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? I think he's trying to get something through to us. Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Isn't that what Peter confessed? Isn't that what you confessed when you came to faith in Jesus? It's not that we overcome the world by our strength, as if we have to be resilient, strong people. Couldn't do it. You can't do it. I can't do it. Sooner or later, the world catches up with you. Death does, if nothing else. But you have a mighty Savior who has overcome the world. And if your faith is in Him, and if you are holding to Him, then you too will overcome, and you will share in His victory. Beloved, John writes earlier in his letter, we are God's children now. You know the Father through the Son, by the Spirit. We are now God's children. What we will be has not yet appeared. I can't imagine how beautiful you're going to be on that day. Some of you are, well, okay, but let's face it, none of us are terribly beautiful in this room, okay? But on that day, you're going to shine in glory. You will be revealed as the wonderful creation that God made you to be in Christ. That's not appeared yet, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And so what's the challenge? That everyone who has this hope in him or her 
purifies himself or herself as Jesus is pure. You see, the hope of the future is what makes a different now, difference now in the present. Not just that it allows us to keep on going because we know what it's, what's coming, but it makes me want to become more like Jesus now. It makes me want to do his work in the world now to become pure as he is.